surgical team has assembled here to operate on the most complex structure known to humanity, a human brain. The patient in this case is a 20-year-old woman with epilepsy. She is subject to what might be called electrical storms in her brain, which cause seizures. The surgeons must locate and remove the source of the storms. To do so, they conduct a careful exploration using electrodes on the surface of her brain. The electrodes detect the electrical activity of various areas. This activity is then recorded on a graph and displayed on a video monitor to be interpreted by the surgeon and other doctors. Unusual recordings tell the team where the focus of the epilepsy is. This procedure demonstrates that the brain has an organization that can be explored, no matter how formidable the task may seem. The human brain is, after all, a structure, an organ made of proteins, fats, water, and other chemicals. An average adult brain weighs only two and a half to three pounds and has the consistency of thick pudding. Part of the body's nervous system, it coordinates our actions and allows us to interact with the environment. The fundamental working units of the brain and nervous system are cells called neurons. The brain alone has 10,000 million of them. The task of each is to generate, to receive, and to send impulses. We can think of these impulses as traveling in two ways, electrically and chemically. In essence, our thoughts are the results of these impulses. A typical brain neuron consists of a cell body, a set of receiving branches for incoming impulses, and a major sending branch for outgoing ones. The electrical impulse begins when a receiving branch is stimulated. The impulse travels through the cell body and then along the sending branch. When it reaches a junction with another cell, it stimulates the release of a chemical transmitter. This chemical crosses a fluid-filled gap called the synapse to be received by the next cell. It can then cause that cell to fire, as in this case, or it can prevent it from doing so. Dozens of transmitter chemicals have recently been discovered in the brain. A deficiency of a transmitter chemical called dopamine in a part of this man's brain has given him a mask-like expression and a tremor in his limbs. These are symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which is fairly common in older people. An insufficient amount of dopamine is produced. In some cases, the patient may be treated with a drug called L-DOPA that in effect replaces the transmitter. We can go back to the brain surgery to demonstrate the electrical nature of the nervous system. In addition to recording the brain's electrical activity, the surgeon will use another kind of electrode to introduce a small electric current into the patient's brain. In essence, he creates a nerve impulse that travels through her nervous system. Oh, anything there? The patient must be what? conscious to report the results of the doctor's probing. She feels little or no pain, for the brain has no pain receptors of its own. When you see her mouth open, it is because the doctor has stimulated an area of her brain that controls the mouth. She isn't moving it on her own. Oh, anything there? The patient may feel a tingling sensation somewhere else on her body instead. The impulse could even cause the patient to see things that aren't there or hear music. The effect depends on the site of the stimulation. Advances in science and technology enable humans to perform such feats routinely. And yet we still don't know fully how the brain works. How does it regulate the body? How does it think and dream? and explore itself. Our knowledge of the mere existence of neurons is not yet a century old. Their basic electrical mechanisms have been understood for less than 50 years. 
their chemistry is still a vast frontier of research. The task of exploration is further complicated because the brain's parts are not as clearly visible as our illustration shows. In fact, the brain is densely packed. The neurons are supported by other kinds of tissue that regulate the brain's chemistry and supply the neurons with nutrients. Nevertheless, we can see something of the brain's organization by looking at it in cross-section. We can see faint color differences that become obvious if we specially stain the tissue. The dark areas, called gray matter, hold the cell bodies and receiving branches of the neurons. They are centers for brain activity. The white areas, called white matter, are dominated by the sending branches that carry impulses from one location to another. The human brain is unique in its abilities to explore, to create, to adapt, and to think about itself. One might imagine that it is completely unlike anything else on Earth. And yet, in structure, it is not so unique. In fact, it bears a long evolutionary heritage. Neurons are seen even in very primitive, brainless animals, like the jellyfish. The brains of many vertebrate animals have a basic structure similar to that of our own. By looking at their brains, we learn about ours. Typically, a brain consists of three major parts. Here's the brain of a fish. It has a part called a brain stem, it has a cerebellum, and it has a cerebrum. This is a very primitive brain. The crocodile is a more complex animal. Its brain is larger in proportion to its body. But it too has a brain stem, a cerebellum, and a cerebrum. A goose is more complex still. Brainstem, cerebellum, cerebrum. The intelligence of an animal species depends largely on the size of its cerebrum in relation to its body. As we climb the evolutionary ladder, we can see an increase in the relative size of the cerebrum. A human brain, while it shares the same basic three-part structure, has a cerebrum that is proportionally larger and more highly developed than that of any other animal. However, among humans, almost no correlation exists between brain size and intelligence. More than any other part of the brain, our cerebrum makes us human, yet we couldn't function without the other parts. The brain is a very delicate organ. For protection, it floats in fluid. It is wrapped in three layers of supporting membranes, and finally, it is encased in bone, the skull. <laughs> Despite its protective coverings, the brain is still a vulnerable organ. Repeated blows can cause permanent damage over time, and a single severe blow, even if it doesn't crack the skull or damage the brain, can disrupt the brain's normal operation and knock the victim unconscious. Thinking ceases. Conscious control of muscle is lost. Sensory information is not heated, and yet the heart continues to beat and the lungs to draw air. These vital mechanisms are controlled by one of the brain's most durable parts, the brain stem. The brain stem is an automatic control center for many such important involuntary actions of the body. And it is a pathway for impulses traveling back and forth between the body and the rest of the brain. Consider the body as a kind of machine with certain basic actions that must be maintained and coordinated no matter what the state of our mind. The brain stem helps serve this purpose. It regulates heartbeat and respiration. It helps to wake up the rest of the brain from sleep by activating the other areas. 
It regulates blood pressure moment by moment. If it failed to do so, we would faint every time we stood up. It controls certain reflex actions, such as blinking, and the adjustment of the eyes to varying light. It guides involuntary actions necessary for eating, such as the production of saliva and coordination of the muscles used to swallow. We are then free to think about other things, but it will not allow us to neglect the body's basic needs when the time comes. For example, if food goes down the wrong way, the brain stem will force us to cough. If the brain stem is damaged, the repercussions can be severe. Paralysis, coma, death. The cerebellum is also an automatic part of the brain, but unlike the brain stem, it doesn't start any actions of its own. Rather, it serves as a kind of regulator and coordinator for the muscles. The body has hundreds of muscles. When we perform an action, we don't need to think about which ones to contract or relax at just the right time. We simply move. Normally, the cerebellum guides the muscles smoothly through the actions we wish to perform. It helps us to maintain muscle tone, posture, equilibrium, and it helps us to orient our bodies in space. It seems to work by comparing nerve impulses from all over the body and brain to ensure that our muscles are doing what we want them to do. When we practice a movement again and again, the cerebellum is one of the brain's areas that benefits. This woman has multiple sclerosis, a disease that in this case prevents her cerebellum from coordinating the muscles of her body. For her, even the simple motions that most people take for granted are extremely difficult. The cerebellum, like the brain stem, is automatic. These structures perform their tasks whether we think about them or not. Voluntary actions are created by the cerebrum, a structure so complicated it remains largely a mystery. When examined anatomically, three major areas of the cerebrum are seen. The innermost parts are sometimes considered part of the brain stem. Like the brain stem, these parts are automatic control centers for certain essential functions, such as the regulation of body chemistry, of sleep, of appetite, of body temperature, and more. Impulses from all over the brain and body pass through this area, which acts as a kind of relay station. For example, when the body needs food, this part of the brain receives that information and relays it to the areas above it, and we consciously feel hungry. If more urgent matters require attention, hunger is suppressed, and the more important information enters consciousness. Emotions are generated by another complex called the limbic system. If certain areas of the limbic system were to be stimulated by an electrode, the patient would feel an emotion. The limbic system also contains centers important for learning, and through it, we perceive the sense of smell. Senses other than smell are primarily perceived in the outermost layer of the cerebrum, the cortex. The cortex is a wrinkled blanket of gray matter, wrinkled so that more of it can fit into the skull. Conscious control of many muscles, language, reason, are all functions of the cortex. Indeed, it is with the cortex that the human brain can think about and explore itself. Like the rest of the cerebrum, it is divided into two major hemispheres. Scientists have learned much about the cortex through the technique of brain surgery we saw earlier. 
By electrically stimulating the brains of thousands of patients, they have been able to create a generalized map of the cortex. Impulses are sent to the brain from the sense organs. In the cortex, they are interpreted as sound or sight or taste or touch. Through mapping, we have determined that hearing is perceived here. Vision is back here. Taste, touch, conscious muscle control. The exact functions of many areas of the brain, called association areas, are less understood. They seem to assemble information into thoughts, plans, and ideas. Surgery such as we have seen is performed only when absolutely necessary. For obvious reasons, then, it is difficult to study a living human brain directly. Much of our knowledge has come through the study of the effects of brain damage on our fellow humans. Neurons are among the most delicate of the body's cells. In infancy, we have more of them than we will ever have for the rest of our lives. Throughout life, they die and are never replaced. We have so many that we are a little affected by the gradual loss. But when a large area is damaged suddenly, the effect can be catastrophic. Ironically, science can benefit from the tragedy. One year ago, at the age of 32, this woman suffered a stroke. The blood supply to part of her brain was blocked by a blood clot. Today, she is partially paralyzed on the right side of her body. The damage occurred in this area, where certain muscles are consciously controlled on the left side of the cortex. It turns out that muscles and the sense of touch of the right side of the body are controlled by the left hemisphere of the cerebrum, and those on the left side of the body are controlled by the right hemisphere. The nerve pathways cross in the brainstem. Nothing is wrong with her muscles. Her brain is simply unable to guide them. If one of the association areas is damaged, the results can be harder to interpret. This man suffered a stroke that damaged an association area on the right side of his brain. He now has a problem called left side neglect. It's as though he forgets that he has a left side, or even that there is such a thing as leftness. His therapist works with him to make him more aware of his left side. She asks him to use both hands to catch the ball. For a short time, he will comply. Some patients with more severe damage to this area will actually deny that they have a left side. They might say that the arm belongs to someone else who is playing a trick on them. Though in this patient, the damage is not so severe, eventually, his left arm drops to his side, neglected. Because the hemispheres of the brain look symmetrical, one might expect that they function equally. In fact, this is not the case. This man is undergoing therapy to overcome a difficulty caused by a stroke on the left side of his brain. He is confined to a wheelchair and is working to correct a language problem. He can converse quite normally. He has no difficulty understanding other people, and yet he finds it hard to name some things. Young girl? A girl. Um, uh, Can you think of what letter that starts with? That's a um, pop poplar. Oh, excuse pop me? Poplar. A poplar. Okay. The brain has two major language areas. They are usually located in the left hemisphere of the cortex. Damage to a part of either of them can result in very specific language problems, such as the one we saw. If the damage had occurred in the same place in the right hemisphere, there would probably be no language difficulty. T? T. T yes. Teddy bear. Good. Roll up. Roll up. Good. One of the most remarkable and instructive cases of brain damage began in the autumn of 1848. 
One day, a Vermont man named Phineas Gage was working with blasting powder in a quarry. Using an iron rod, he tamped the powder into a hole in the rocky ground. The powder ignited and shot the iron rod straight through his head. The rod entered here, passed through the front of his brain, and then out. It seems almost a miracle, but Phineas Gage survived, despite the violent destruction of a large part of his brain. To a stranger, he may even have seemed normal, but to his friends, he was a different man. From being a typical, capable workman, he became obstinate, quick-tempered, and short-sighted. The damage to his brain changed Phineas Gage's personality for the rest of his life. It turns out that the front of the brain enables us to control our emotions and to plan ahead. Phineas Gage lost these areas. Strive.